thank you so much for coming today, everybody. Uh, we got it. Um, I'm Nicole Wilson. Uh, I'm an assistant professor and Canada Research Chair in Arctic Environmental Change and Governance at the University of Manitoba. And as Claire mentioned, co-chair of this group. I'm here today um, with uh, uh, Colleen James, uh, who will give a brief introduction to herself. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, happy to be here. Um, excited about the discussions. Uh, my name is Colleen James. My Tlingit name is Gochkla. It means wolves mother. Uh, and I'm from the Dakhlawadi clan, which is a wolf clan here in the traditional territory of the Tlingit people, the Athabascan people, the Tagish people. Um, yes, so very uh, happy and honored to be here to talk today. Um, so yeah, I I think uh, we mentioned we're joining you today from Carcross Yukon in the traditional territory of the Carcross Tagish First Nation. Um, and we're gonna be presenting on some of the work that we've been doing over, um, I think I first met Colleen in 2012. So about since for 10 years, uh, the work that's been happening with CTFN related to water governance. Um, so we just wanted to start with a few acknowledgements. Like I mentioned, um, this has been an ongoing effort at CTFN um, and many, many people have been involved, um, including um, we have a water committee. Um, and so just wanted to acknowledge the 10 people on that. Um, there's many staff that have also contributed. Um, we wanted to specifically acknowledge Mark Wedge. Um, Rita Johns has uh, worked on this a lot over the years, Eleanor Heyman. Um, and also Tracy Camilleri, uh, Camilleri uh, who's the water governance project manager currently um, on a project that's funded by Polar Knowledge Canada. Um, so this work that we're doing kind of is centered in this idea of Indigenous water governance. Um, and so um, we talk about this in terms of Indigenous relationships to water and modes of interacting with decision-making processes about water. Um, while this is not um, necessarily the assumption of colonial approaches to water governance, it assumes that Indigenous peoples have inherent water rights, responsibilities, and authorities that flow from their own governance systems. And that um, the ability to, um, you know, protect water uh, according to these, their relationships is very much shaped by historical and ongoing colonialism. Um, there's a picture here of a water ceremony. I don't know if you want to um, describe it a little bit, Colleen. I sure do. Uh, this is a picture of a group from a uh, Yukon Water Forum in 2019. <clears throat> and these are the uh, two young people. Uh, one is on the water committee. The other was doing some research around plastics in the environment. And uh, often water ceremonies will involve and include the youth who pack the ceremonial water down to the water body. In this case, it's Toss Lay I, Pikefish Lake. And we all uh, collectively put our prayers and thoughts and feelings and intentions into the water and the youth carry the water down and put it into the, the bigger water body. And the emphasis is on, on uh, the respect of water and the respect of water within us also. So a lot of this work has been uh, rooted in this idea of revitalizing Indigenous law, um, which uh, flows from, you know, Indigenous story, ceremony, um, et cetera. Um, and um, in relation to water, um, there uh, are other folks who are working on this. Um, uh, I take a lot of inspiration from the work of M.A. Kraft, who's a Métis and Anishinaabe legal scholar um, who's been um, doing work um, with many elders on a project called the Anishinaabe Water Law Project or Anishinaabe Nibi and Akinagewin. Um, internationally, this is also the case where we see increasing acknowledgement of the, the personhood and, and legal rights of various bodies of water, um, including the Fanganui River being one of the most famous examples. And this is the, uh, the picture on the left depicts the rough outline of the traditional territory lines of the clans of the Karkos Tagish First Nation, formerly known as the Tagish Kwan. Kwan being <clears throat> related to a geographical place or a house from a geographical place. 
you'll see the line in the middle that cuts through the center of the traditional territory. That's the BC Yukon border. Border. So north of that line, uh, Carcross Tagus First Nation has a modern treaty. Uh, south of that line, we have uh, unceded rights and unsurrendered uh, territory that's in uh, negotiations now. Our neighbors are also in negotiation, so we find ourselves in 100% uh, overlap in that case. But the, the, that's our wonderful country, and our hopes are to have some of the, the tools uh, that we have in the north of that line agreement push over and spill over into the uh, BC Treaty once uh, that gets figured out. So that's a picture of our traditional territory. And you can see the little red dot right in the middle almost. That's our uh, Natasahin, uh, which means slow running water, which our town is named after. In the Athabascan language, it's Todazani. It means wind blowing all the time. And it's a perfect place name because that's what happens here in Carcross off of Bennett Lake is this strong winds all the time. The picture on the right is our wonderful Ha Shigun Hidi, our ancestor's house. It's built uh, and completed in 2019 with a lot of pomp and pageantry to ring in and revitalize our culture and language uh, that was took a heavy hit in the 70 years that the, the Indian residential school lived here for 70 years, taking the Indian all of, out of the child. So this building, uh, which represents our, 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 our house to uh, revitalize the language and the culture, uh, before you here stands the clans, six clan totem poles of our nations. We're matriarchal people, we follow our mom, so we're born into these clans. So on the left, you have the uh, the Dakhlawadi clan. I just have to pull up, right. I can't see very good here. I think the center one is the um, the Kokatan clan. Uh, the next one on, uh, is the Wolf Ganachtedi clan. Uh, uh, the next one over here is the, oh, sorry, that's the Ganachtedi. The green is the frog. The one on the far right is a split tail beaver, has four legs uh, and two tails, which is very significant. So those clans all represent our, uh, those total folds represent our clans. And they're the decision-making bodies of, of, of our people. They're either wolf or they're crow. I'd like to note that uh, one, two, three of those are direct, directly related in, in relationship to water. So I am killer whale. Carcross is a semi-arid desert and uh, the killer whale on the coast, uh, an hour and a half away is the rainforest of Skagwe, Skagwe or Dai it's called. And so that land water connection uh, doesn't, doesn't exist, can't be separated for us. Cause here we have Keat, the killer whale north of 60, uh, away from the ocean, and that's our Preston emblem. So we're very proud of this Hashigun Hidi house. There's a lot of uh, work going on here to revitalize things and to establish our, our governance uh, with, with everyone else who lives here also. So now um, Colleen's going to uh, tell uh, one of the, the water stories that um, has been so important for this work. I'm going to I'm going to summarize this one because all night I studied this other okay. one. So I'm going to I'm oh, going to summarize this one, but them. I'm going to tell you Great. another one. Okay? <laughs> good, good. So uh, a long time ago, uh, Crow was like Doug. He was very white. He was that was his color. You know? And as he traveled around, he's always the trickster. You know, he's our trickster. He's trying to get things. And in this case, he could see that his uncle, Ach Sunny, had a house and inside his little tent house, he had all the water and in that water was all the fish. And so Crow thought, gee, I wanna get that. You know, how do I get that? So he thought he's gonna challenge his aunt, uncle to a who's older and smarter contest, right? So they're gonna uh, get into the boat and sail, sail somewhere. And uh, Crow got lost because Achsani, his uncle, or Petrol, also known as, he had a fog hat. 
So that fog hat was able to guide him right home in all of his wisdom, right? So Crow didn't win that one. So Crow decided he's going to camp with his uncle for a little while. So he's in the tent one night and he challenges his uncle again. He said, oh, he said, I'm, I'm the oldest. His uncle said, no, I already beat you. He's like, no. And so Crow said, let's have a storytelling contest. So he let his uncle go first and his uncle talked and talked and told stories and he started nodding out and then it was Crow's turn. So Crow started telling stories and talking and talking and pretty soon his, his uncle was sleeping and he thought, ah, now I'm gonna do it. So he went outside, it's winter time, you know, cold out. And he went outside and he got a little bit of poop, frozen poop and he brought it in. And he put it at his uncle's feet in his bed. And he sat down for a little while and let the fire do its work. After a little while, he was like, ach, sunny, ach, sunny. He's like, what's that smell? I think you missed yourself. And his uncle was like, Jay, no, how could it be? How could it happen? He said, oh, I think you're right. He said, I better go outside. So he went outside to go clean himself up. And while his uncle was outside, Crow started greedily drinking the water that that old man had in his tent, drinking the fish, drinking as much as he can in his mouth. And he flew up to take off with that water and fish to fly through the smoke hole. And uh, just when he was gonna do that, his uncle walked into the tent and he said, he said, grab him. And he threw a little bit of pitch into the fire. And he said to his fire spirit, grab him and the smoke went up black and it crow couldn't get out that smoke hole he couldn't see he was full of water and fish and he was stuck there for a while so he fought around and finally he broke loose and after he broke loose he flew around this country to the taku river and he dropped the water and the fish there and to the stockheen and to the yukon and to Daisleen Lake and Auckland Lake and Bennett Lake, all the water bodies around us, he distributed that water and shared it for us all. In the end, that little bit left in his mouth was all salty. You know how when you leave water in your mouth, it gets salty, eh? So that salt water that left, that's the one he flew around and he left it to be the ocean. And that became the salt water as we know it. And that's the little story about how there's a crow, crow creation, crow stories, crow cycle stories. And this is one of them, how he was able to get water for us all and to deliver those fish to all the streams for all of our benefit. And that's the story of how crow gets water. Before that, he was white. Today, he's black. That's the price he paid for getting that water for us all. Goodness, geez, I'll leave it there and we'll care. If we have room, I'll, I'll, I'll summarize that other one. It's very okay. important also. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, about the, the reason why, you know, these stories are so important is like I was mentioning about Indigenous law and Indigenous water law. This this is where we get our, our knowledge about, you know, um, about how to protect water, what um, relationships, what the relationships to water are. Um, and so really taking the time to um, listen to story and, and think about the lessons learned and the principles from those stories is important. Yeah, and take not treating them like old stories, like they're, they're, they're living stories that can help us to solve a lot of problems today. We just have to shift our thinking and how we look at them and take those action verb words and transcend them into policy or law or or however we decide to do it. Um, so this is, um, as I was mentioning, um, this Indigenous water governance work or this water research um, I've been doing with CTFN for about 10 years, um, following a, a community-based approach. Um, and uh, I think I originally started working with CTFN when I was an employee uh, for a brief period of the Yukon River Intertribal Watershed Council. I finished my master's research um, where they were a partner in Alaska and they asked me to come join some grant funded projects here. So 
uh, I came to Car Cross and did some, some workshops and I first met Colleen um, doing an interview about water um, and I've been hooked ever since. <laughs> I learned so much um, just talking to Colleen and other people here. Um, and so CTFN and, and several other Yukon First Nations agreed to be partners for my PhD. Um, and as I was finishing up the PhD, of course, um, coming back to the community multiple times to return results and, and get feedback. Um, I was giving a presentation and um, uh, the land management board here, um, several members asked to meet with me the next time they were down in Vancouver and, and um, asked me if I'd continue to work with them after my PhD. And so we applied for funding for a postdoc, um, which I completed. And I'm now as a professor at University of Manitoba, I'm looking forward to continuing this. Um, and so this diagram here just depicts sort of roughly the stages of um, how research needs to be done working with communities. So you're really centering it on uh, questions and objectives that are um, important to the community. It's not just your own journey. Um, you're involving the community in all phases of research, including conducting the research, um, involving communities in analyzing the data, which is actually one of the things that happens less often. So we're working on that. Um, and of course, giving back the results. And this is an iterative process. You don't just do it once. Um, and it's designed in a way to um, avoid the kind of colonial histories of research, which are very extractive and in a manner that respects indigenous protocols and self-determination in research. Um, and so, um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. But um, I've I've had the opportunity to work with CTFN over the years, and I'm grateful that they continue to want to work with me. Um, so this is a um, <laughs> a diagram that um, I ask this question often when I'm talking about water governance. So um, you know. From a Western or, or Western perspective, you might say like, this question is so obvious. We know what water is. Um, this is a picture of the, the hydrological cycle or the water cycle. We know that water is a material substance and it cycles through these familiar processes of the cycle, condensation, um, precipitation, et cetera. Um, but this question is actually very important in highlighting the differences between uh, indigenous approaches to water and, and uh, Western or colonial approaches in that this qu question is answered very differently um, from an indigenous perspective, which um, sees water as a living entity, as a relative. Um, and so um, it's important to, to center it in, in, that, kind of, um, in that kind of approach. Um, and, and we'll revisit this kind of idea later. Um, so I wanted to give a little bit of background in terms of colonial water governance in Canada. So a lot of it flows from you know, the Constitution Act of Canada uh, in terms of how the authorities are, are divided. And so this diagram here just shows that in the Constitution Act of Canada, it divides authority between the federal government and the provincial and territorial governments. Provincial and territorial governments can delegate certain authorities to local or municipal governments, but nowhere in these arrangements are um, Indigenous uh, rights or relationships or responsibilities to water considered. Um, and so um, this is very problematic. There's this assumption of crown jurisdiction over water or that the crown or um, originally the British, when they came here, they, they um, kind of this doctrine of discovery that they owned all the water. Um, and that even where there are reserves created or treaties, that water is not part of that. Um, and so what we say is we need to think about what Indigenous law tells us. We need to think about um, how water could be included or, or should be interpreted as being part of Section 35. So I could give like, you know, a three hour lecture on this, but <laughs> that's just a really brief description. Um, and we'll give more detail on the water governance uh, context uh, um, in Yukon and British Columbia, where CTFN has its territory. Um, so Colleen mentioned um, there are modern treaties, um, also known as the final agreements in Yukon, um, which um, were uh, negotiated, I believe, started, starting in 1973. And um, so when we say modern treaty, just this is to distinguish from historic treaties, which are primarily the numbered treaties in Canada. Um, and in um, accompanying these are self-government agreements. Um, which give or which acknowledge uh, First Nations to have what they call province-like powers, for example, the ability to develop their own legislation. Um, and the modern treaties in Yukon have whole chapters about water, which are one of the most substantive 
acknowledgments of water rights for Indigenous peoples in Canada from a colonial perspective. Um, so they they contain really powerful language, including the right to unaltered water quality, quantity and rate of flow, including seasonal flows on or adjacent to settlement lands. Um, settlement lands are the approximately 10% of the traditional territories that um, First Nations retain title to um, through these agreements. Um, but there's also other provisions in terms of protections for traditional use of water. Um, and the agreements also saw the creation of uh, co-management boards. Um, and one of them, um, the board actually predates the agreement, but it's the Yukon Water Board, but the agreements made it into a co-management board. So that's the body that makes all decisions about um, water licensing. Um, and so there's a lot more that I could say about this, but um, important to this context, um, CTFN does not have an, a, a land claim agreement in the, the British Columbia. It is unceded territory. Um, and so, um, so it's, yeah, it's a bit different to kind of be dealing with these two governance systems, including um, the primary piece of legislation related to water in Yukon being the Yukon Waters Act. Um, and in British Columbia, uh, we have a newer kind of modernized uh, BC Water Sustainability Act that was enacted in 2016. And I just wanted to add too that we, we voted this uh, modern treaty in 2006. Yeah. That's quite some time ago. And so we're starting to feel a lot of pressure and starting to really push back because, um, you know, we, we negotiated and, and uh, sacrificed and, and met others halfway and we have no regional land use plan. We have no chapter 14 water management. And at this point, we've always said water and land are not uh, separated. And so that's our, our biggest push in relation to uh, chapter 14. Uh, chapter 11 is a land use planning. We feel that those tools are a little bit old now and need to be sharpened up. And so these discussions hopefully will push that into that arena. So part of my PhD research was to specifically look at chapter 14. Um, and I, I worked with um, members of CTFN, uh, Trondek Witchin, Carcross, uh, <laughs> uh, Kluwani First Nation and White River First Nation and asked decision makers and knowledge holders in these communities what they thought of the agreements and specifically chapter 14. And um, many people mentioned uh, that there are substantive and positive changes introduced through the agreement that give an increased ability to uh, influence water governance, but there are also um, some limitations and a lot of limitations are around this idea of crown jurisdiction that I was mentioning before. Um, and so that's this idea that the, the crown owns all of the water. Um, and um, so this is illustrated in the Yukon Waters Act um, where it says uh, water belongs to government. And so um, as we'll detail more um, in terms of CTFN's relationships to water and, and generally speaking with Indigenous peoples, when, if you understand water as a relative, um, it, there's just another layer here of it being very problematic for another government to kind of unilaterally say that they, they own that water. Um, and so in the, um, these arrangements and also how like the processes through which decisions are made, I think one of the limitations is also that um, these worldviews, um, non-Indigenous or settler worldviews related to water are very much uh, privileged um, in the, the forms of governance. It really is our view when those king salmon are spawning in the river, they own the river. So all of this has led to kind of an ongoing water governance project. Um, this is a picture I, I snuck of a uh, with permission, I'm using it, uh, of Colleen and Mark Wedge, uh, I believe back in 2018 or 2019, uh, during my postdoctoral research, just uh, a little hallway meeting we were having, <laughs> brainstorming about um, implementation of chapter 14 and this potential idea for CTFN to develop their own water legislation, et cetera. So this work is ongoing. Um, it's not something you do overnight. It takes a lot of thinking and, and uh, a lot of process um, and CTFN has other kind of ongoing things that, that have been contributing to um, thinking around this. Um, so I don't know if Colleen, you wanna talk a bit about the water declaration and the proclamation? Uh, yes, uh, so uh, after doing some work with the elders and doing some research with Nicole and others and Dr. Eleanor Heyman and all of the clan elders and specifically the fluent speaking uh, elders, 
um, we came up with this uh, declaration about our relationship with water, you know, that water is a relative and that it's a medicine and, you know, um, so the, the, and it's in still in draft form because we're still having discussions, you know, what, what, what do we want? What, what can we follow through and carry? You know, what can we implement and uh, enforce for lack of a better word? Um, so this is a really uh, powerful document in that it talks about and states our relationship to water and that there is no ownership uh, involved there and a lot of stories behind it. Um, and also on your right hand side is a proclamation that Carcross Tagish First Nation did at the end of March, March 30th, I think, and it was to to highlight uh, and, and promote the fact that we are still here. We have these modern treaties uh, that uh, land use is, is uh, how we use the land uh, needs to be discussed and looked at. And also that water and land weren't separable. But on the proclamation, it, it pretty much lays out our elder statement where the elders are saying, why is it that we negotiated this agreement? Why did we see release and surrender so much? Why is it we retain 10% of our traditional territory as settlement land? So we started looking at that. And so they, they essentially, it's kind of like the basis of a law. You know, we who are Tagish and we who are Tlingit, our roots have grown into this land since olden times, right? So it's, it talks like that. It talks about working with everyone for the benefit of everyone for clean water, including uh, the fish. It talks about uh, working together to implement the modern treaty. But it also says um, without free prior and informed consent from Carcross Tagish First Nation, uh, folks could find themselves in trouble either or find themselves in tribal court or in territorial court. And so basically it lays out uh, for anyone who wants to use or permit anything on the land, a process for them to follow. One of them is a Nations Connect where it simplifies uh, uh, consultation and redirects folks to all the information that they need. And more importantly, it uh, introduces the how we walk with the land and water concept, which is a tri three First Nations initiative to lay the groundwork of what's important and valued in the traditional territory, invite in all other users and governments to collectively work together uh, uh, toward a plan for land use in the Southern Lakes, which is the most highly populated. So two very, uh, the one on the right is more uh, legal and, and uh, stronger. The one on the left is uh, a work in progress. So um, in terms of grounding this work, uh, I just wanted to share a few kind of ideas or teachings that elders have um, shared over the years, including the late Stanley, Stanley James in 2012. Um, so I was brand new to Yukon and uh, just um, learning about Indigenous knowledge of water. And Stanley, during an interview, said um, that the laws for water we have, um, the laws we have for water are in the clan houses. Those kinds of things are important because we need to respect water. And I think this phrase summed up in two, two sentences has really, um, you know, uh, guided the work. And um, I, I still think about, you know, what this means today and um, how we center that in the work that we continue to do. Similarly, um, Norman James in 2019 um, said that clan and discussion are the things we need to know how we should protect water. So again, centering things in the clan system and spending time uh, amongst the, the clans to to discuss, you know, what what process should be followed, what is needed, um, things like that. And know that we all we view everyone as having a plan, right? So just because we have six clans, you know, Nicole has a plan. Uh, Justin Trudeau has a plan. So, like we mentioned, uh, there's a CTFN Water Committee that was established through a decision of the Land Management Board here. Um, who's the decision body for all um, um, decisions related to um, land and water or the environment. Um, and the um, 
body reflects this clan-based system, um, or all decision bodies here at, uh, at CTFN do. So the, the Water Committee is no different in that it, it represents all six clans. Um, it also um, has elders and youth, which is really important. Um, so there are um, six um, people representing each of the six clans and, and four uh, youth as well, just to make sure the intergenerational piece is here. And there you see Colleen uh, facilitating the workshop um, in her great style there back in 2019. And three of those folks are my, one's my mom and two are my uncles. <laughs> hi, hi, Nicole, sorry, that was your two minute warning. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so this is just a wordle we created out of all the notes of the, the meeting. Obviously it was about water since water's at the middle. Um, and some of the principles uh, just that kind of have um, just been distilled out of the, the, from the water committee, but also all the interviews conducted over the years, really centering on this idea that water is alive and has spirit. Um, water and land are not separate. Um, water is a relative. Um, water should be respected. Um, and, and many others that uh, we don't have time to go into today. Um, but in our thinking, um, there's a lot I could say about this, but maybe we'll just skip this, this slide for now. But there's yeah. a lot of questions around, is law the right word for what we're talking about? So hence in our title, we talk about waterways. Um, in terms of what we're looking at here, um, working with the committee, thinking about centering things in Indigenous law, learning about the colonial law in the situation and finding something in the middle in this um, third space and ethical space that helps to navigate between them. Mm -hmm. you say anything about that? Uh, yeah, so just catch and release is a big one. Catch and release fishing in the Yukon 80%. Uh, if we could have our way and not have anyone play with any of the fish, even 50% being caught and released would be acceptable to us. So, um, I won't go into detail on this, but we've been looking at what other Indigenous peoples have been doing in terms of creating um, declarations, strategies, policies, legislation, all of which are informed or can be informed by Indigenous law, going from declarations to legislation being increasing, increasingly um, specific and prescriptive. Um, so we're looking at those, looking at options for what CTFN could do. And I'll spend my, we'll spend our kind of last minute uh, talking about kind of some key lessons, I think, most of these are kind of from, from my perspective in terms of saying like, as a non-Indigenous person, um, really learning that water is a relative and how important that is and how that has to animate all of this work. Um, relationships, not just to water, but also to people come first above anything. Um, and that we need to um, get out, get away from this academic approach to just like focusing or it's not just academic, but um, often like Western approach to focusing on outcomes, we need to um, really settle into the process and appreciate that. So emphasizing process over outcomes. I'm not sure if there's um, anything else that you wanted to I, emphasize. And just in this key lessons thing, just think of uh, what happens when we, we are giving birth to a baby. You know, our baby is in water. We are all relative, you know, and that relationship there comes first. And the emphasis on the process of birth in clean water and how that all works is present, you know, it, it rules over the sort of the outcome. So that's a powerful one, uh, how close we are to water that way. Mm, yeah. Yeah. So I think with all of these in mind, like it would be easy for me to be like a consultant or an external researcher and be like, oh, I wrote you a water strategy, but that's not, you know, that's not going to, that's not going to work. So we're engaged in this process and continuing this work. Um, and with that, I guess I just wanted to say uh, thank you. Yeah. If you have any final words. Uh, there's our fire pit. It's a, the center of all governance as per Norman's uh, comment about discussion, you know, get all the clans around that fire in discussion about that water in the background, about that air in the background. That's uh, Pikefish Lake, Tosley Eye in the background, our lovely traditional territories, those sentient mountains and everything is connected and related. All right, I'm going to stop sharing our slides so we can see everybody for some questions. That was so great. Thank you guys so much. I learned so much. Uh, so I'm just going to stop recording now. And as Nicole said, open the floor for questions. So we have about 18 minutes for questions. <laughs>